Well, Pam, which way are you going? Left or right? Right. Ah, uh, that's too bad. Why? Well, because it was a 50-50 shot on whether you'd be going left or right. You see, we're both going left. You could have just as easily been going left, too, and if that was the case, it would have been a while before you started getting scared. But since you're going the other way, I'm afraid you're gonna have to start getting scared immediately. Good evening, campers, dreamers, and babysitters, and welcome back to another edition of Splattercast. I am Dylan Newell. And I'm Luke Janesco. And yes, we are kicking things off this November with a Dylan pick. Uh, this is a fun one. This is one that I have been uh, deciding on where and when I wanted to kind of throw this in, like where I was thinking about going into. Um and yeah, man, this was uh, this was one that was just kind of batted around for me for a little bit because like I think I wanted to do this one a few months before, but it just didn't feel like the right time. Um, and then, you know, as we're getting closer to this upcoming holiday here in the States, uh, for those of you who don't know, we're celebrating Thanksgiving uh, later this week, starting on Thursday, I believe is Thanksgiving for us here. Uh -huh. um, you know, that's a it's a. It's a great holiday with lots of food, lots of family. Everybody gets together, lots of people sitting around a dinner table. So I figured, hey, why not talk about a film with one of the most uh, iconic dinner table scenes of all time, the original Texas Chainsaw Massacre? You know, I really feel like this film, um, at its core, defines family values. So I think <laughs> this is a good pick for the uh, holiday uh, season. Yeah, and, you know, we haven't, I don't know if we fully committed to it yet, but we are possibly going to make this a Thanksgiving week tradition, depending on how things go, or at least a November tradition where you might be uh, tackling uh, each film in the series for the next few years. So we're going to talk about that one, but I think that would be a good bit of fun because yeah, if you're talking crazy families in cinema, uh, the Hewitts and the Sawyers, whatever you want to call them, they uh, they're up there. Uh, for quite a bit. I know that that name kind of switches as you go throughout the series and also as you uh, get into the remakes and the reboots and, you know, the remakes of remakes and whatnot, because this series has been, my God, like there's it's so many uh, ways they've tackled this, tried to reboot it, and it just seems like it, it never really could pick itself back up after, in my opinion, the first two films. Yeah, um, boy. Covering anything beyond this one is probably going to be a little rough stop for me. But, you know, this is such a franchise that is absolutely muddled where it was, what, dormant for a little bit for the, that sequel to come out. And then it's been kind of consistent in terms of having a, a film release every few years. And again, in poor quality. So it's just very, very odd that, you know, it's been around. People have been uh, had the idea enough to say that there is potential here but never really acting upon it almost. And it's such a basic concept. I mean, you look at this first film here and it's nothing, you know, uh, out of the, you know, too crazy out of the ordinary where it's a basic concept. It's just great tension, uh, 
with a great handle on how you wanted to tell that story where it's like that gets lost in translation. I feel after this film, it's very odd. Yeah. And you know, we differ on the sequel for sure. I know for a time I was on your side of things with it, but then a couple of years ago, I kind of revisited this film uh, and saw a little bit of the light at the end of the tunnel as uh, you know, some might say, um, and I actually really enjoy that one. So that's going to be an interesting one we'll tackle for sure, I believe, next year. So if you guys are waiting for us to talk anything Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2, that will be next year. But yeah, that's that's going to be an interesting podcast. I know you initially pitched that maybe we do that one because uh, there was going to be so much uh, differing discussion between yes. us on that. And yeah. that's where it's like, I haven't revisited that one in a few years. I remember watching it and not enjoying it. Um, and then, you know, yes, we are on the opposite ends right now. I'm going to give it a rewatch probably here soon, actually, since I just picked up uh, that Scream Factory edition since it's out of print. And I uh, it had the slipcover. So I was like, oh, I got I to gotta pick that one up. So I'm going to give it a rewatch here probably within the next few weeks. I don't anticipate me. Uh, flipping the script and joining you on that side of things. But yes, that one is so, that is absolutely a film I'm eager to talk about. Oh yeah. And you know, this, I guess we'll just start kind of hopping into it before we get to the actual segments here. Uh, I just want to know what was your first exposure to the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, Luke? Uh, this uh, film I watched, I think maybe in middle school, actually. Um, I remember hearing about it. Um, there was, you know, it, hearing that it was uh, a very like violent film just by you know people um probably adults more so than anything um so i knew i had to get my hands on it so i remember renting this uh when i was at my dad's house over a weekend and uh wanting to actually crack this one open and actually see it this one uh for some reason i remember this one always being um when i was trying to get my hands on it for probably about a month it was always gone from the video store so i can never really acquire it so then one time went there lo and behold um uh right there on the sh uh, shelf so picked it up and i watched it right there um i'll be honest um watching it uh through the lens of probably an eighth grader and um already being you know introduced to the likes of uh freddy krueger you know, Michael Myers, uh, Jason Voorhees, I'll say I was a little bit underwhelmed uh, from my my viewing of this one, just because it is such a independent kind of film. You know, I think that love, um, I'm not going to say for everybody, but at least for me, um, like watching this and understanding it, I think that love grows for this film. I agree with you, man. I watched this probably about the same uh, not time frame as you, uh, cause you were in middle school a lot earlier than I. So it was one of those things where it's like, for me, I watched this, uh, in middle school though. I think it was about eighth grade, um, that I picked this up. I think my dad rented it for me from, uh, Netflix again, one of those when they were still doing DVDs. Yep. Um, right and on. yeah, so I remember watching it and it was right in that boom of me just watching a ton of horror. And yeah, I remember, I think I turned it off just after the dinner scene, okay. uh, just right before the ending. Cause I was just like, I don't care. Like I was just so let down because I had been, it had been built up in my head for so long, just how gratuitous and how horrifying and violent it was. And, you know, it was one of those things where I then would watch like the remake and I was like, Oh my God, that was horrifying and everything. But as my taste changed, as I grew up and everything, you know, it's some of those things where it's like, I still think I enjoy parts of the remake. I think that it's a good uh, good showing for Platinum Dunes. It's their first real attempt. You know, we'll get into that in a few years. But, you know, for me, you know, I went back to this, I want to say, probably in my junior, my junior year of high school and picked it back up and, and watched it. And I was just completely transported. Like, I, I felt like I was watching a totally different movie. And I think this is something where it's like you got to be a little older. You have to be in a, a a bit of a more mature mindset to really pick up on the horrors of it. Because, you know, as a kid, you're just waiting for Leatherface. And Leatherface yeah. to show up and he's cool, but he's not really the Leatherface at the time that we know him as. He, he's he's not the the icon yet. You know, he's kind of yeah. cowering and, he, he you know, the kills are pretty quick and pretty bloodless throughout most of the film. So it's kind of like, OK, well. 
where is this horrifying massacre that's been built up for years and years for me? Like, where is this massively disturbing movie? And it's not, like I said, until you get a little bit more mature and get a little bit older that you kind of see the context of the film and really start to pick up on things of like, oh, my God, like they've been in a trap for, you know, this entire journey almost. You know what I mean? Like they've they've really been uh, brutalized. And it's like I, I appreciate the bloodless scenes. I appreciate the horror of just the situation itself, especially as I guess did you get older. Yeah. And, and that's where, you know, I've mentioned it on the podcast and probably on the Sunday Scaries where you know, a lot of these films go by a specific equation that had been, by the time me and you had gotten to this film, already been laid out. You know, we were already expecting something, especially living through that, uh, you know, watching through the, the 80s slasher um, and the wave that that brought in. So as soon as you, you finally put in Texas Chainsaw Massacre, you're expecting something completely different. Um, where, you know, when this film was made, we weren't necessarily trying to create a horror icon that's going to live for decades upon decades. Leatherface was just a character in a film, and uh, Toby Hooper was just trying to tell, you know, that specific story. So it wasn't like this is a Leatherface vehicle. This is just, uh, you know, uh, something that happens in, in Texas, and there's a guy wearing another, you know, a face of a, of a person. But, you know, by the time we had gotten to it, Leatherface was already an icon where, He's, you know, people are dressing up at like him in um, haunted houses and, you know, Halloween in general and stuff like that. So there was such a different element and probably a different expectation at that point when this came out. Something like kind of like Friday 13th, where if you watch that original after watching, you know, two, three, four, five, and, and you're going to go back to that original film and it's something different. You know, they didn't know where that was going to go either. So, you know, going into the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, especially... Uh, with a name like Texas Chainsaw Massacre, there's already an expectation, you know, and the way that this was shot and almost the bloodlessness in this film, uh, you know, doesn't necessarily live up to it in terms of if you're just pictures in your head or what you know after seeing Friday 13th and Halloween and everything. So, I think this can be for that first time viewer not really knowing what to expect here. It can be a little bit of a letdown, I feel. Yeah, and I think that it is a movie that uh, grows on you, especially yeah. with subsequent viewings, just because, you know, you really start to dive into the characters of the Sawyers themselves um, and see kind of how the dynamic works and, you know, exactly what it is and how they, they aren't really all related. They're more just a ragtag group of people who've kind of come together. And it, it that's really where the disturbing elements come through is it's just a group of psychos that really got together and became a family in the in the end here. You know, and it's like, I know the later sequels and remakes and stuff, they kind of muddy the water there. They kind of take their own interpretation of it. But, you know, I think like this in its purest form is definitely, uh, I would say, the scariest that they get. Uh, yeah. Just because they are so unknown, like that you don't really understand, like, how far this stuff goes and how deep this goes. You know, one thing that struck me, and I'll say it now instead of saving it for, you know, as we go through here was the opening to this movie um, and just how I was pretty off put because like, I don't know why. And I've seen this movie a dozen times now, but like the opening never really caught me of like, that's uh, the hitchhiker snapping photos and stuff. I always thought like, Oh, that's just an interesting uh, disturbing kind of like just take that they took of it, like showing that dead body, but no, it's the hitchhiker. And he's snapping photos of the corpses. And then they talk about him rearranging it and everything. And I really think ultimately what sets this movie up in a, a really strong way when it comes to giving you a build up to that horror, it's that uh, opening monologue. We use it yeah. for our uh, our show here uh, with Account of the Macabre. And I mean, like that sets the stage beautifully because it already just uh, with its words describes this horrible event and it really gets here i can imagine sitting in a theater just going into the title of the texas chainsaw massacre and it's starting with that and then you're like oh my god like this is about to be the most terrifying experience of my life like it's it's going to be insane yeah especially you know star wars having that opening scroll that is so iconic and everything and this is iconic in its own way as well um and that to have that uh, voiceover just reading it, you know, adds such a different element to it. As soon as like 
um, you turn it on, you know, watching this a, a couple times before the podcast, it gets you right, especially after knowing what to expect here. It really gets you in that headspace of, you know, you're ready to um, relive everything in this film. You're ready for the uh, annoying Franklin or uh, the the heat that's kind of um, portrayed through the lens there where, like, you feel dirty and messy and sweaty, you know, um, all that stuff. I think that opening scroll there with that voiceover really gets you in that headspace. Absolutely. But alrighty, I think we can glide into our first topic here. I think that's enough uh, bitter banter at the start. We can kind of go right into it with uh, our first segment that we like to call The Account of the Macabre. The film which you are about to see is an account of the tragedy which befell a group of five youths. In particular, Sally Hardesty and her invalid brother, Franklin. It is all the more tragic in that they were young. But had they lived very, very long lives, they could not have expected, nor would they have wished to see as much of the mad and macabre as they were to see that day. For them, an idyllic summer afternoon drive became a nightmare. The events of that day were to lead to the discovery of one of the most bizarre crimes in the annals of American history, the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Yeah, so this is where we're going to kind of go over the synopsis of the film. Uh, as we always state, you know, we kind of switch uh, flip-flop here on who writes it. Uh, so I am writing this one. And uh, yeah, this was definitely an interesting one for me to try to get down for you guys. Uh, you know, I get a little wordy with uh, how I like to do things here. So hopefully I can kind of keep it nice and concise. I think I did a pretty good job. But to kind of dive in here, setting the stage... A group of five youths decide to take a day trip down to South Texas after learning that the graves of two of their uh, of two of the members' families have been desecrated and robbed. Along the way, the group stops and picks up an erratic and disturbed uh, hitchhiker who has an eye for photography and a taste for blood. Kicking him out after uh, refusing to pay him for his photographs and him getting a little taste of Franklin, the group stops at a roadside gas station with no gas but some damn good barbecue. The group still a bit shook up from their hitchhiker friend. Uh, the group decides to press on and make it to the old Franklin house for some exploration. Things start to go sideways when Kirk and Pam go for a bit, uh, a go a bit too far to the neighbor's homes. Uh, when Kirk goes inside to explore, he's met face to face with one of the most shocking uh, character reveals of all time. Leatherface rips open the door and slams Kirk across the head with a large mallet. Uh, leaving him flopping on the ground. Pam is not so lucky herself. Soon after, while looking for Kirk, she finds herself uh, she finds herself as well face to face with Leatherface, and uh, he grabs her, drags her across uh, the ground, and throws her up on a meat hook. At night, Sally and Franklin start towards the other house. The masked man ambushes them, killing Franklin with the chainsaw. The man chases Sally into the house where she finds a very old, seemingly dead man and a woman's rotting corpse. The man chases Sally back to the gas station and vanishes. The station proprietor comforts Sally for a moment, after which he begins to uh, beat her savagely with a broom after she kind of realizes that uh, he isn't as innocent as he seemed before. Uh, the proprietor uh, subdues her and then drives to the other house. The hitchhiker appears, and the proprietor scolds him for his actions at the cemetery, identifying the hitchhiker as the grave robber. As they enter the house, the masked man reappears dressed as a, in woman's clothing. The proprietor identifies the masked man and the hitchhiker as brother, and the hitchhiker refers to the masked man as Leatherface. Uh, the two brothers... Uh, bring the old man grandpa down the stairs and cut Sally's finger so that grandpa can get a taste of her blood. Uh, Sally ends up fainting and the next morning she regains consciousness. The men taunt her and uh, hang, hang on. The men taunt her and bicker with each other resulting in them attempting to kill her with a hammer but they also try to include grandpa in the activity. Grandpa's grip is weak and he drops the hammer repeatedly. Sally breaks free and runs onto the road in front of the house. Uh, pursued by the brothers, an oncoming truck accidentally runs over the hitchhiker, killing him. 
The truck driver attacks Leatherface with a large wrench, uh, injuring him and escaping on foot. Sally, covered in blood, flags down a passing pickup truck and climbs into the bed, narrowly escaping Leatherface. As the pickup drives away, Sally laughs giddily. Leatherface fails his chain, uh, flings his chainsaw around in frustration as the sun rises. And that is the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Uh, what a nutshell it is. I tell you, that Leatherface tantrum at the end, it always gets me. Oh, yeah. It's a really ballsy way to end the end a movie, too. Yeah. I would say, because it's like it doesn't really give you all that much of a wrap up. It's more just escaping the uh, the events. Yeah. You know, and I think that's a good I know we're jumping to the end, but mm -hmm. um, I think that's a good way to end things, especially with these kind of horror elements here where, you know, the original Halloween. I think that's a great way to end that is, you know, they're still out there. Nothing's been really resolved in any sense. And I like that ending where. You know, he's just flinging that chainsaw around in circles, uh, doing his own thing. And yes, she gets away, but who knows who's going to be coming down that um, down that uh, stretch of road and uh, falling into Leatherface's hands. You know, I, I don't know about that trucker. I don't know if he. <laughs> yeah, he probably. I think he just booked it afterwards. Didn't he, he just going. started running up the road? So good Lord knows what he's going to stumble across. Um, and, you know. We're not doing the, uh, you know, the They Live segment this time, but it can be mentioned that uh, Phantom Limbs does have an article uh, talking about the Steven Susco uh, follow-up trilogy well, that yeah. was supposed to happen. And of all of the ways the Texas Chainsaw Massacre has gone through all of these sequels, that could have been a really interesting take uh, you know, of I where to go with it. it. Um, well, we don't have to go too deep into it, but yeah. from... What I can tell you is that it was supposed to be a trilogy and uh, they were all going to be a little different. But the first part was going to uh, pick up directly after this moment. We were going to see Leatherface hobbling on home and it was going to deal with the events of that day after Sally gets back to civilization. And, you know, we don't necessarily see her from what I understand, yeah. uh, but we see the family dealing with uh, the repercussions of everything that happened. Um, I think that would be a very interesting take on it as well, because I think there's still a lot of story there, which is why this, you know, first of all, it, it's, it baffles me. It took this long to, it, it took as long as it did to make part two um, and not really pick up anywhere after uh, the original had, had finished because it just seems like there's more story there. It's like, there are so many different questions. I would love to see that fall out and see what happens next with Leatherface. Yeah, and I mean, it's one of those things, too, where it's like you, you've you always been curious about it. Like, of course, the, the sequel, not to get too deep into that, um, does show where the family ends up. But it is, like you said, a few years down the line. Yeah. So, you know, we, we don't get that direct what happens to them. We kind of get it in one of the later sequels where they do show what happens. But that movie is messed up uh, from the timeline from the get-go. It really uh, messes a lot of things up and makes it not so good. Yeah, um, which is unfortunate. But uh, yeah, with this film, I mean, like this is the Texas Chainsaw Massacre in its purest form. Uh, I think that, you know, if you are interested in the series, this is probably going to be the uh, best starting point. I mean, usually the first film in any series is. But this is where that concept works in its like full potential, in my opinion, in my opinion. And I think like going through that little synopsis there, it was pretty clear to see. And so... With that, I guess we can kind of start moving through the story a little bit and start talking about it. So I said the opening uh, a little earlier, it was something that I never picked up on is how it opens with, you know, that uh, what we saw from our little uh, account of the macabre um, thing, which I should probably throw that graphic up. But, uh, you know, we open with that and then we follow into photographs being taken of dead bodies. And, uh, you know, it's just kind of dawning on me at this point that that was, um, you know, the hitchhiker uh, snapping photos, rearranging corpses, kind of being a little bit Michael Myers like there yeah, uh, with that. And I always thought that, you know, that was, again, just a sight gag, just something because, you know, that uh, that uh, photo snapping sound is iconic with the series. Absolutely. They use that heavily with the uh, remake and the, the prequel to the remake. Yeah. That's one of their like most uh, acclaimed sounds there. 
But uh, yeah, it's just one of those things where it really does set the stage of unease. I think like this film spends those first two to three minutes with the, the opening and now this really kind of just unsettling the audience with just imagery. Yeah. So that way, when the story does start, you're already on edge. And I think that's a great way to start uh, a horror film. Yeah, it, it's very provocative in a sense where, especially for this to be like a mid 70s film and to kind of discuss this, um, I, I don't know, kind of obscene way of, uh, you know, digging up these corpses and then positioning them in, in particular ways and photographing them is a, a very unsettling thing to even deal with, I, I feel at that time. Even today, that's still very unsettling to even think about because these corpses are just laying there you know what i mean completely defenseless in the in to for someone to kind of have that almost fetish in a sense to uh position them when whichever which way you feel like it and then photograph them um it just a very interesting opening like that because it, it already kind of again with that opening scroll and then just with this dynamic um you know where as soon as we get into it it's like what two corpses positioned in a very specific way yes the, uh, the two corpses are positioned and then they talk about how uh many of the graves have been disturbed yes and, and they have that kind of i think it's a radio voiceover isn't mm -hmm. it where they're talking about it it's like a report and then they have that visual there um really again all that stuff really sets the tone within just a few minutes of what you're going to be going through uh with this film because i, I think uh what after that it, it's kind of uh getting to know the group a little bit more kind of living with them in, in their travels rather than uh you know straight off kill real or, or anything like that we we get into it but i think there's a pretty good uh, grace period of almost what 20 25 minutes before we really get into uh seeing leatherface for the first time oh yeah we don't see leatherface until like i think right about the halfway point of the movie i'd say yeah. maybe even a little over yeah, I think uh, so. It's only an hour and 23 minutes. So I don't think we see him until about the 40 minute mark. So. I always forget how short this film is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is a really, really short movie. Um, but yeah, basically what we get into is we just start to meet our characters, as Luke was saying. Uh, you know, we, we've got all our characters. Of course, we've got Sally, who ends up being our final girl, uh, played by Marilyn Burns. Uh, Jerry. Uh, then we got Franklin, Pam, and Kirk. So they're all kind of our, uh, our our main cast there. They're the ones that we're following. They're talking about horoscopes and star signs and all kinds of stuff. And then they, uh, they end up uh, going to their destination, which like we said in the synopsis there is Franklin and Sally's grandfather was buried in that, uh, that graveyard. So they came to check to see if the uh, grave had been disturbed. And it looks like, uh, I just caught the offhanded dialogue this time, of it looks like he, his grave wasn't. So, you know, they can basically uh, have a sigh of relief there. And then they end up uh, heading on down the way to go to the old Franklin house. Yeah. Which is and where, that's when everything starts to go awry. But there's a little more in between there. Yeah, because, uh, like, talking about the introduction to the hitchhiker, which, uh, does he have a name? I don't it's know. just the hitchhiker. Okay, there's a the hitchhiker. Um. Just that, that interaction in itself is very weird. You know, he, uh, what's the actor's name? Do you give it up? Yeah, it's uh, Edwin Neal. Uh, he plays that uh, so perfect. You know what I mean? Where it's like the jumping around, the kind of explanation of um, the, uh, what do they call it? Like the, the plant of where they're processing meat and everything like that. And just how that they do it. And all that. Yeah, it, it's just like it, so disgusting. Again, Building the tension, building this world here, uh, Toby Hooper does it so well. Uh, because, again, you just feel dirty uh, watching this film. And it's like, um, I think this is what kind of Rob Zombie strives for in terms of how to create a film, but maybe hasn't really succeeded in, in that in that way. Because this is like something where I I will always get like flashbacks of Texas Chainsaw Massacre. I'm like, well, now you, you overdid it a little too much. And this is like the perfect, again, equation. Uh, to make a film like this yeah because see the problem is, is if you did this with rob zombie uh he'd be talking about yeah my brother he goes and fucks the cows and i, I yeah. hit the cows and i kill the cows and stuff like that you know and it's like the the stuff they're talking about is pretty disturbing in and of itself and it's how he's real. like all that, that yeah it is real it, and that's the thing that i picked up from this i was like no no that, that bolt's no good you know the other way the old way that's the good way 
Yeah. You know, it's just like, and he's not really giving a reason to why. Uh, but it's like, and you can kind of infer once you kind of realize who he is that it's uh, because it's less torturous. Yeah, it's like I could easily see uh, people saying like, "I can't eat meat after watching this film." Oh yeah, like it, it's rough, and you know, it doesn't have to show too much. Yeah, you know, it's all it's descriptors. Nice. It's all really just them describing the smells and how they feel. And just the the people that are around it and everything like that. Um, Because even Franklin makes fun of Pam's character a bit. uh, Because she's talking about just how gross all this is. And he's like, oh, well, you'd like it if you didn't know it was in it. Kind of thing like that. And it's just like, it's very true. There's a lot of people, um, you know, who don't know where the food is processed and what goes into making it. That they they probably wouldn't like it if they knew it was in it. But, you know, it's just because we don't. And, you know, we just see in this little package at the store that it's all good. So it's like it takes all the the guts and glory out of it. Yeah. And, and that's where, you know, going into the writing of this film, I think it's very smart mm-hmm. uh, because they're not saying anything that's untrue here. And then just the character work I- inside the van itself. Uh, I, I know we'll get into the actual uh, actors, but uh, just Franklin and the way he portrays that is just absolutely perfect. Going into the... Uh, where they're talking about like the bolt gun and everything like that, and where he's doing the, you know, the almost like, <laughs> mimicking how, how it works and, and how animated he is with that. Again, and it just doesn't stop either. Yeah. Like he starts and he's just like, ding, ding, ding. Yeah. ding. It's just like, Oh my God. And it's dude. just like, you know, beating it into your head. I, I think it's just, uh, we, we don't get a tremendous amount of backstory for any of these characters, but uh, the way that they're portrayed just uh, in the van itself and the camaraderie that we get, it's very memorable. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, you know, I would be, uh, I'd forgive anybody for kind of uh, the first time around not really understanding the relationship uh, with some of these people because, yeah. like, you know, it's not until a few viewings that you kind of really start to understand the dynamic. So it is it is really bare bones. Like, that's the thing about this is this movie was made for nothing. And, you know, we'll get into it with production history and all that because um, there's a really great documentary. I know it's on a couple editions of the Blu-ray, but it's also uh, available on YouTube. You can just search it up and watch it. The Tex- making of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. It's like an hour long. Uh, really interesting stuff goes through all of it. And uh, yeah, they, they went through some hell, especially in this uh, this van specifically, because like it was hot as fuck making this yeah. movie because like it was nothing. They had no money. They were literally just uh, uh, like a ragtag group of crew and, you know, their actors. And that was it. So it was just kind of like they just kind of had to wing it most of the time. Yeah. And it's and, amazing the product that comes out. And, you know, going into the, the story here where I said, you know, at the very beginning of the, of the podcast, there there isn't anything, you know, uh, too wild going on in terms of in-depth storytelling here. And, uh, yeah, basically all help hell breaks loose once we're introduced to Leatherface and that's kind Mm -hmm. of what everyone is expecting so I can really see it you know him not being introduced so halfway through the film people almost checking out because you're really expecting something you're expecting Friday 13th part four or six or you know you're expecting this kind of thrill ride uh that a lot of these horror icons have taken you on and you're not really getting that with the Texas Chainsaw Massacre but as soon as Leatherface pops up on screen absolutely jarring like um very abrupt you know you hardly have any time to process it um uh when he is um hits him with a hammer is that what it was yeah he hits Um, kirk with the hammer when he hits kirk with the hammer and you know that could have been it one of the things that i i find unsettling is the convulsions um that kirk is having on the ground you know because it could have just been one swipe and, and a clean clean hit and we're you know, he drags him in and we're done. But like the way that he is shaking after being hit in the head brings up a new level of unsettlingness for me. You know what I mean? It just seems, uh, I think that was such a a smart way to play it. Um, And then as soon as uh, Leatherface drags him in and then shuts the, slams the door, like that's like, that's prime filmmaking, you know? Mm -hmm. No, that's, it's definitely a very unsettling sequence. Uh, and it's just one of those things too, where it's like you, you know, you don't see it coming that first yeah. time. I mean, maybe you do it nowadays if you've exposed yourself to a lot of, uh, you know, horror YouTube channels or seen a lot of documentaries where it's like that scene is played constantly. 
uh, because it's so effective. But if you yeah. go into this blind and you've never seen it before, that is terrifying. You just you'd never because it's also there, there's a lack of music. There's no music kind of building yeah. you up like you get in some of these later horror films. This it's simply just you hear the door open, Leatherface kind of squeals a bit, and then smack, and then you just hear him convulsing. Yeah, and it's like that's really uh unsettling that's what makes it feel more real in a sense yes absolutely and it's just like there's no bells and whistles to it you know uh when i was talking about the equation where it's like you know in the 80s it was perfected where it's like this is very visceral very brutal uh we're in the embryonic stages of kind of really figuring this out and this is where you know some people uh may not like the texas chainsaw massacre compared to what they've seen but this like this film is so early on in terms of that tidal wave that's about to about to come where it's like this and black christmas have really kind of almost laid the paved the way you know like uh are leading us in that path of the slashers of the 80s so like this is where you really get a lot of those elements and influences and i think that big one there is the abruptness of uh how that all goes down with kirk and leatherface because it's like one of the things that we'll never be able to understand is you know just seeing Leatherface for the first time because before I'd even seen this film I knew what Leatherface looked like you know I had heard descriptions I've seen images so as soon as he showed up on screen yes a jarring experience but I knew what to expect in terms of the, the visual there whereas I would have loved to have been an audience member you know and just seeing him for the first time and taking in the abruptness as well as that visual of Leatherface um it it, it works on so many levels Mm -hmm. no it's definitely uh one of the best as far as character intros that's kind of why i wrote it that way because it is like it's it's just a great like intro to a character like that's honestly the best way i could put it um so going from that you know to kind of give us a little wrap up here into our, our story so we get introduced to leatherface you know before that uh, we meet um, the patron at the gas station who, you know, at first seems like nothing. He just seems like a guy who's there. But then we kind of start to realize that he is kind of the, the matriarch of the family, uh, you know, played by uh, Jim Sidow, uh, who just goes by the name of Old Man. Um, what a fucking performance, honestly. Like, I, I love him so much in this. And we'll kind of save it for, uh, you know, the cast and crew segment. But I mean, he really does uh, offer that kind of almost uh, caring, kind of like, you know, all you kids don't want to go playing around in old houses kind of thing, giving them a warning. But then once they've kind of crossed that barrier, it's just kind of like all bets are off, like I'm done. And I think it's so interesting that the hitchhiker and Leatherface kind of razz him a little bit later for not yeah. doing any of the killing. Yeah. He's just the cook, as they say. And th that's what I like about these dynamics here is, uh, you know, we have it in the opening of, of the podcast where he says, I'm not one for killing people. And uh, he almost mm -hmm. has these twisted set of values, the things he will do and things he won't do. And I just love it. It's interesting for him to get back to the house after everything's unveiled. And he's just barking orders at everybody. You know, it's like, mm -hmm. you know, the way he is uh, ordering Leatherface around, you know. When he got, comes out of the kitchen, he tells him to get back in there. And uh, just the way he is, like, so commanding of everyone there. And then they're like, well, you don't even do any of the killing. You're, you're just the cook. You know, it's very interesting, um, the kind of dynamic that they put on, in, in this family. Because he's, he seems like to be the one that is reserved almost in a particular sense. Where, you know, Leatherface, not really. You know, he's just hitting people with hammers and selling people up. Whereas the Hitchhiker's just digging people up, you know, um, and taking photos where he's kind of like, well, you know, I don't kill people. You know, I, mm -hmm. I have a, a different set of values. I thought it was a lot of fun. Oh, yeah. And I think that, you know, that's even further expanded upon in the sequel, too, with him. Uh, they do a lot of funny stuff with his character and kind of what he later on becomes. Uh, but he's always been an interesting part of this family to me because he's just – a little bit more put together than the rest. Yeah. And, you know, that's always just been one of those things where it's like, I'm so curious. He can kind of see. blend into society, whereas the other ones stick out like sore thumbs. Where exactly. Like, like the, the Trojan horse to kind of, you know, be in there and you're not going to think twice. But then by the time you do, obviously in here, it's too late. Yeah. And it's like, that's almost what makes him so scary is because, like you said, he could be just a normal guy. 
in society and you'd never know um but yeah so we meet him and then we get to the the farmhouses and leatherface ends up taking out kirk and then he takes out pam which is one of those scenes that i know a lot of people uh talk about too and it's just so iconic again with no blood where yeah. she gets put up on a meat hook and you know the way they kind of did that was super uh you know crazy and just kind of like one of those i can't believe they did this no insurance company would ever let a film do this uh the way they they kind of decided to do it um but it's just one of those things where it's like it's it's a really interesting fucked up kill and yeah. it's like i i appreciate it because it is just one of those ones that it's like i you know you could just feel it through the sounds the acting everything uh of just like you don't need to see all the blood gore and viscera you just yeah. need to hear the sound of her getting put up there and her reaction to it. Just almost that loss of breath uh, really quick. It's just horrifying. Well, the, and that's where, you know, I talked about in terms of story, there isn't anything overly in-depth. I mean, this is where, you know, you pick out kills from any of the other slashers and you have like a, a couple of memorable ones where the other ones kind of just fall by the wayside. Um, so it's like very hard to reminisce and uh, figure out which each and every kill that happened in any installment in the slasher franchise. Whereas this one, that's really what they hang their hat on in terms of, you know, once the story gets going, we're just killing everybody. And each kill is very memorable from Franklin to Kirk um, to Pam. It's all like uh, you remember each different one in, in how they went about it. And I think that's the uniqueness of this film where I think um, everything was handled so perfectly, where it wasn't just uh, oh, you know, let's get on set and figure out how this is going to be, you know, how are we going to kill this character? It was all well thought out in advance to make each of those scenes memorable and each of those characters have their own individual death. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's like, and, you know, you do kind of lose a little bit of that individuality, but I still think it kind of, it still strikes in just the right way when uh, Jerry is killed because Jerry ends up discovering, uh, yeah. I believe it was Pam in the, the freezer, yeah because she's yep. kind of tied up now um and, she and pops out i think is how it goes yeah and then he uh yeah then he gets struck in the head with the hammer as well yeah so you know it's like it's not like it's the most original thing but i think the thing with him is him kind of stumbling across and getting a little further into the home than the others did yeah and, um, I, and, I, and I think with him it. is what i if i'm remembering this correctly there's a little more with leatherface after that after yeah, uh, he hits him. Then he that's where that that kind of scene for me sits where, yeah, his his is very quick. But the aftermath of what happens with uh, Leatherface and him kind of looking outside and sitting down. And that's how we kind of end with him sitting there and, you know, licking his teeth and stuff like that. I think that's where that one falls in terms of how, how memorable it is because of the extra that is given there where it's not just like the abrupt, you know, hitting him with a hammer, dragging him in or putting her on the the meat hook this one we kind of sit with leatherface a little more and i think we kind of did need that kill uh to kind of get in the headspace because at that point this this character is a little more of a question mark we don't really know what he's going through and then as soon as we see him kind of move and is how how he's kind of sitting there we, we start kind of getting a glimpse of what is making leatherface leatherface i guess yeah and you know this is one of those things that like you gotta appreciate how they portray this part too because this adds more realism again is to where you know leatherface is you know from all accounts from what we understand uh he, he's mentally handicapped yeah uh so it's one of those things where he's like he's definitely uh on the spectrum he's got deformities he's got all kinds of issues um so he doesn't fully understand what he's doing yeah he, he and they they portray it like that that's always been toby hooper's intent and how gunner hansen was told to portray the character because it was one of those things where he's just like in that sequence after he kills Jerry and he's like, you know, looking out the windows and stuff, he's scared because he's like, yeah. where do these people keep coming from? Why do they keep trying to infiltrate my home and everything like that? So it's like in all reality, you know, you look at Leatherface is kind of a victim in this movie and he yeah. is kind of protecting himself and his, his, his house, and his family. He may be in the wrong, but at the same time he doesn't see it that way he doesn't understand and it's not just like a he doesn't see it that way because he's evil he just doesn't see it that way because that's his life yeah and that's where i think this is really kind of where that kill gets set apart as well because uh the way this is played where he looks out the window and he's looking back and forth it's not played by as like some 
psychotic brute that is looking for his next kill. It's looking for who's outside in the woods, who's going to be coming into my home next, and then kind of just sitting there with the unsettled uh, movement that he does. You can tell that he is completely disturbed by what keeps happening here and doesn't really know what to expect, who's going to be coming through the door. So it, it I think that's where this one lies in terms of uh, how memorable it is because we get so much more with Leatherface. And I think that's a great trait to add into these these uh, killers, I guess, because we don't really get that with anyone else. You know, I'm, uh, we get a little bit of that extra motivation with Leatherface. Mm-hmm. And you know, I, I think that it does humanize him too, yeah, uh, to to a pretty strong degree there. Where it's like, yeah, you can still see him as the antagonist of the film, but also it's like if you know, once you kind of dive into it a little bit, you do sympathize for him a bit more. It's all about perspective. Yeah, and then we we follow up with uh, obviously Sally and Franklin. They're they're driving off or not driving off, but they're you know walking through the forest, uh, you know, trying to figure out where all their friends are going, and then we get probably my favorite kill in the movie. I think it's a lot of people's favorite too, is just that uh, Leatherface busting through the darkness with the chainsaw on and, and then just hacking Franklin to death in the yeah. chair. I think it's uh, everyone's favorite kill just because Franklin is dead. Oh yeah. I mean, Franklin, from what I understand from the documentary I watched uh wonderful actor, very nice guy uh, played his character beautifully. Cause he's annoying yeah. as fuck. And you know, it's just one of those things where they, they absolutely, uh, they hate that character, hate working with him. He's just such a little brat. Like, uh, I don't know. Uh, where do you feel like all that comes from with him? Because like, I kind of never understood why he was that way. You know, and it's impossible to tell exactly what kind of life uh, Franklin has had. So I think you kind of get a little bit of it um, earlier when they're in the house. And um, he's almost, I think he's sitting in the the downstairs trying to get through in his wheelchair and he's like, Oh, why don't you come Franklin? It'll be fun. Ha ha ha. You know, like he's like saying this all this stuff to himself while everyone else is upstairs and he can't really, um, you know, get up to where everyone else is. I and think experience it. Yeah. I, I think this is, it, it's kind of probably been a constant, this m feeling like he's been missing out on everything because he is in the wheelchair. So I think he has this kind of disdain uh, you know, where he can never actually uh, experience everything that everyone else does. And I feel like almost because of that, there's over like an overcompensation to be the loudest in the room a lot of the times, as we see where he's, you know, mimicking the bolt gun, he's hammering it in. And you know what I mean? It's like after one, after another, after another, it's not just enough to say at one time where it's like almost this, uh, I have to, you know, drive this home and be the most memorable person in the conversation right now. Yeah. He's got to try to command every, every scene that he's in. Yep. Um, but yeah, no, I mean, he definitely gets the most brutal I'd say. And I think the most gory death other than the hitchhiker in the film. Yeah. Uh, you know, he his is definitely pretty, pretty intense. That's, I guess what people were more expecting when you read the title, Texas chainsaw massacre. Yeah. Because uh, they, they don't leave any of that to your imagination. I mean, it's dark, so you kind of get a little shaded with that. But yeah, they, he, Leatherface gets him good. He, he saws him up. Um, and then, you know, we move on from there to uh, him chasing Sally, obviously, to the gas station, where we then find out that, you know, the old man is, uh, or the patron, he's a part of the family as well. They get her back to the house, and then we get into this dinner scene. Uh, and you know, obviously we meet a couple other members of the family. They got a dead body in the, uh, of an old woman, uh, in the upper part of the house, which is like grandma, very psycho imagery there. Yes. Uh, you can definitely see that they got some Hitchcock, um, inspiration. And then we, uh, we get into this dinner scene, man. And this is definitely one of the most iconic, uh, scenes in cinema. This is why I chose this for Thanksgiving, just because, you know, you got a kooky ass family sitting around. Uh, you know, kind of describing, you know, who they are, what they are, almost unintentionally. It's almost through their arguments and their banter that you get so much of that dynamic there. Uh, and Sally's just freaking out and she just has to bear witness to this. Yeah. And I think that's the funnest part where even watching this film, you know, a handful of times, you're always waiting for them to get back to the house because I think that's probably the most fun. And uh, just the dynamic, the family dynamic that they have there where you're saying, you know, you learn about 
most of this stuff through their bickering. And I, I love that that's the way it's presented. You know, it, it they're not presented as a cohesive family in any sense. You know, they are legitimately the most dysfunctional type of family uh, that you could have. You know, so it's like, you know, even them making fun of each other where you're just the cook, you know, where it's like they find something wrong with him not wanting to kill people where it's it, it's the same dynamics that a lot of families have just put in a different kind of reality. And I love that they, they brought that there because it feels real. You know, they're not arguing about things that necessarily we can relate to, but in the manner of which it's being discussed, I think everyone can kind of relate to, you know, going to a, a holiday and having to put up with your aunts, uncles, cousins, brothers, sisters, someone that, you know, gets on your nerves about something, you know. Um, so I just love the way that's presented because it seems like they aren't really cohesive. It's just they're all at odds in some sense. Mm hmm. Yeah. And, you know, I think that it also just kind of it also does highlight the depravity within the yeah. family of just how normal this is and everything and, and just how, you know, they've been doing this for so long. And that they just really, they don't see any issue with it anymore. The humanity of what they're doing is gone. So they, they are just really, uh, this is just another day for them to, to be, you know, eating people and getting it maybe a little bit more of an active day. Uh, but, you know, for them, this is just what they do. And, you know, like the the digging up the bodies and the, the stuff at the graveyard and things like that. Uh, they talk about it in the opening. We kind of skipped over it a little bit how they're talking about parts of the bodies were just missing yeah so it's like i'm wondering if they're getting to some of these rather fresh and then uh you know taking those body parts for food and whatnot yeah so. well and i and i love that it's like um i when sally's being tied up to the chair there's just like an like a hand and a forearm on the one of the chairs you know it's just like oh, yeah i think that that type of stuff those little sprinkles of um viscera and gore there i i think really set the tone there in terms of what you're really stepping into. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, just the dinner scene in general, I mean, how, how courteous was it for them to bring grandpa down so that he could uh, <laughs> partake and uh, meet their new guest? I know. And then they'd start talking him up about how uh, he was the one at the slaughterhouse. He used to hit him and he's like, Oh, he hits him good. Like he, nobody hits better than grandpa. And so they, they then try to kill Sally and they have him uh, sitting there with the hammer. Like, honestly, the dark comedy of that sequence alone is one of my favorite bits also to the scene where it's like they just keep trying to give Grandpa the hammer and he keeps dropping it. Yeah. And then, like, he does hit her, but, like, he drops it on her at one point. Yeah. And, and like, you know, it's just like it's... the building of the tension there where it's yeah. like comical almost. But knowing that, you know, once he connects, that could be the end of Sally, you know. And so it's like the stakes there are really set. You know, it's like once he connects, it, she's done for. And one of the things I want to bring up, and I didn't catch this, you know, I watched a couple of things in terms of research for this. But and I, it's this sticks out in my head. Uh, so tell me if I'm correct or maybe if you've heard this or if you haven't. But uh you know, the way Grandpa's presented, where I think she thinks he's a corpse at the very, you know, at, at the top, you know, when she runs into him. And then when he's brought down, he's just sitting there at the table. And when they cut her finger and then he sucks on her finger, he's almost doing it as if a baby, you know, drinking formula and the way he's movement. And I think that was said in something. I didn't run across it now, but I think that was intentional because I always pick up on it when I'm watching it. Just the way he's like kicking his feet and hands. It seems like he's an infant taking in, uh, you know, uh being fed you know i always thought that was interesting and again very unsettling oh yeah and i think that just is kind of um you know goes into playing you know what the human life cycle is a lot like you know you you start life needing to be taken care of fed changed all kinds of stuff and then you know you get your independence as you grow up but then you get older and your bones start to get weaker and your body just doesn't function right anymore and it's up to your loved ones to hopefully feed and take care of you and everything like that and you know to a degree you kind of revert back to that and yeah he's very much uh knocking on death's door at that point there he's very dried out so it's like it wouldn't shock me that all he can really do is uh you know suckle on uh the blood and everything like that yeah um again i think it adds to the dynamic of it does no family yeah it is it's a very creepy sequence and it all concludes when sally gets away busts out the window and starts running up the road uh, where the hitchhiker gets creamed by a big old truck. Uh, definitely, again, one of the gorier sequences in the movie. Um, and then 
after that, we uh, we get to see her, uh, her and Leatherface running up the road together. Very iconic shot. Uh, Leatherface cuts himself with a chainsaw in the leg, and then she ends up stopping a truck driver who then gets chased off by Leatherface himself, and then a uh, pickup truck driver uh, drives by. She hops in the back, laughing hysterically that she's getting away, and then, of course, we have the scene that we have in our background here of Leatherface uh, running around, whipping the chainsaw in the air, screaming. So. Yeah. For me, one of the things I take away for this is they keep the chaos for a very long time. After that, once it started the dinner scene, and we kind of we're already heightened sense, you know, and it's very hard to maintain uh, that feeling. But you do when you, once you begin that dinner scene, and Grandpa's there, they're talking. You don't know when uh, they're going to decide to kill Sally, so it's like it could be coming at any moment in time. And then as soon as she busts out that window. And uh, runs down uh, the driveway and into uh, the road. Again, that chaos is kept, you know, mm -hmm. where then the hitchhiker gets hit. And then uh, the uh, the truck driver shows up and Leatherface is chasing all of them, you know. And then he gets hit with the wrench and cuts his leg. And then the pickup shows up, you know. All this stuff is complete chaos. And that is sustained for a good chunk of the the end of the film as soon as we start that dinner scene so uh, for me like that's something where the introduction to leatherface is so iconic uh the beginning of this film is iconic but that ending scene is like what we've been building up to and, and they pull it off to a t oh yeah and you know it ends rather abruptly to some but i think in a, in a perfect place because it's like i don't want to see the wrap up of this i don't yeah. really need to see it if you're going to do it do it in another film yeah, you know, which is exactly what that uh, James Wan, Toby Hooper, Steven Susco trilogy was going to be. Um, and if I didn't mention it, for those who don't know, yes, James Wan was supposed to direct the uh, first film in that trilogy. Uh, the second one would have been done by Toby Hooper, and then I think the third would have been done by James Wan again. Okay. Um, kind of how they were going to do it, but uh, it was it could have been something special, man. Really could have been a nice little. Uh, little timeline to throw on to this but no instead what year we was got that supposed to take place 20 okay to take place uh well, i'd have to I, check i mean uh like what year were they gonna start making these this trilogy now, 2013 I'm... is when it was okay. being talked about so well after that the remakes and all that stuff gotcha. yes but 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 right around the time of the um uh the texas chainsaw 3d let me double check on that real quick while we're going. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, that's Texas Chainsaw Massacre in a nutshell for you there. Uh, of course, I think that, you know, there's we, we just discussed a few really awesome parts and really great sequences. Um, but like, Luke, I got to ask, like, do you have a favorite moment in this uh, in this film series or in this at least this film? Oh, um, well, there are scenes that stick with me. Um you know, that opening at, at the uh, cemetery with the, the corpses there uh, is something that always sticks in my head. Uh, the dinner scene is absolutely iconic. Leatherface at the very end is iconic. But again, if I'm talking things that, like, I find absolutely unsettling that I, that are in my head for uh, this film, it's got to be that Kirk kill. Um, there is just something so weird to me and unsettling when he's convulsing on the ground. It's just like a, a whack to the head. And again, you could have just went straight unconscious and Leatherface drags him in. But the choice to convulse like he is, um, I think it's just so interesting. And mm -hmm. I think that that's something that for me defines this film is. And when we look at things, you know, watching this film and again, what we've talked about you know, living through these 80 slashers and seeing so many different kills, that Kirk kill, I, it, it sticks with me. So it sets it apart from the rest, I feel. So that is my bread and butter for this film, I would say. Absolutely. And I'm going to go ahead and throw it out as uh, the dinner sequence. I know it's really cliche, but that's definitely uh, my favorite sequence in this movie. Uh, going back to it every time, it's just that, you know, you get so much character, you get so much build up and everything. I can't seem to locate exactly where it was. It's a pretty lengthy article, but I want to say that this was supposed to be taking place around the time of the 
Texas Chainsaw 3D when that was, uh, you know, about to be made. They were yeah. in talks to do that, bef- to do this before that. So right around that time. Um, but yeah, no, I, I think that uh, this is just one of those movies that's always will forever be iconic. Uh, but yeah, I guess if that wraps us up for the account of the macabre, why don't we get into a little bit of the behind the scenes with our next segment that we like to call Behind the Mask. It's almost time, kids. The clock is ticking. Be in front of your TV sets for the horathon and remember the big giveaway at nine. Don't miss it. And don't forget to wear your masks. The clock is ticking. It's almost time. Happy Halloween, 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 All righty. So, yeah, this has a very, very interesting uh, backstory to it as far as the movie being uh, where it came from and just all the stuff they had to go through to make the movie. Um, so initially Toby Hooper was coming off of the, him and his team that made this were coming off of their first film eggshells, which I believe is like a comedy. I've never seen it. So I, I don't know it either. Yeah. But I believe it was. Yeah. yeah. So they, but it, genre. yeah, it didn't, uh, it didn't hit commercially. It didn't really send them into the stratosphere. It didn't get them to Hollywood. So Toby Hooper was kind of like, well, why don't we do a horror film? And then that should, you know, get us to cross the barrier there. That should get us all the money that we need and everything. And, you know, we can kind of start our career. So he went and wrote this film and he called it Head Cheese. So that was the initial title and pitch for Leatherface um, and everything like that. Uh, The title went through many, many renditions. It wasn't until uh, Toby Hooper was talking to a close friend of his uh, where he was talking to him and he pitched the title, the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, that his friend was like, well, I would never, my wife and I would never go see a movie like that. That just sounds horrifying and disturbing. Where he was just like, that's the title I'm going to land on for it. Um, but yeah, this was not an easy shoot. There was a lot of, obviously they're shooting in Texas, one of the few uh, films in the series to actually still be shot in Texas, uh, where it's set, you know, like it always mind boggled me when I was young to think that like, wait, you're telling me they're not shooting in Ohio when it takes place in Ohio. They're not yeah. shooting in, you know, LA when it takes place in LA kind of thing. Um, you know, that, that kind of stuff mind boggled me, but this film was actually shot in Texas, which meant that you had to deal with the Texas heat. This was shot in August and yeah, it was not kind to them. There were a lot of days where they're dealing with 110 weather outside and they're in the van, which is at 120 degrees due to all the body heat and the equipment and everything, that people were just uncomfortable, sweaty, smelly, anything you name it. It was rough. And, you know, this being such a visual medium, I mean, you don't really get any of those senses. It's up to the director to really kind of convey what you should be feeling in terms of that setting. And I'll say even just the opening here uh you really get the feel for that texas heat and what is going on there so it i think that uh the way that toby hooper directs this it really transports you into texas and this is you know where you kind of get into uh some films don't really feel like their setting where this absolutely feels like texas like you know it, i would be baffled if this was not shot in texas because for me it's like you know how you never been ne- I've never been to Texas, but you know how like you have a preconceived notion of how each state would be. This mm-hmm. is how I would feel like Texas would be. <laughs> yeah, and you know they they definitely uh, you know they they play it up and they use it to their advantage as you probably should. It does show on screen, like you said, the the grime and the sweatiness and everything. You really do feel like they're on a a hot Texas afternoon. Um, and you know, it's one of those things where it's like, you don't really see a lot of that in, uh, films these days. I mean, even though we love this movie, uh, X doesn't really present itself as like a a hot summer's day. You know what I mean? Too many times. Like there's a couple scenes maybe, but not like this, not where it's like, you can see these people visibly, uh, perspirating and the stains all over them and everything. Uh, it's not very high Hollywoodized at all. Yeah. And that's where it's like this being an independent film, 
as it is really adds to those elements because who knows if you know uh you know main hollywood would have gotten a hold of this would it still have that same feel i don't know but it, this being an independent film i think adds even extra to this film because it you know it adds that feel where uh you know maybe toby hooper was like eh, well maybe you know people will be sweating maybe they won't be but you know just because of that budget it's unavoidable and i think that that adds an extra element here for that realness yeah and just so uh you guys are aware of how low budget this was they only had one shirt for leatherface so for four weeks of shooting in the in the hot sun uh gunner hansen smelled so bad towards the end of the shoot that no one wanted to stand near him no one even wanted to eat their lunch or take lunch breaks near him at all because his clothes stunk so bad they couldn't wash it because it was dyed and they needed to, to be consistent with what they had been shooting so it's one of those things where it's like they just let it go and so gunner hansen kind of really not only got to play that kind of loner off to his own kind of killer uh but he had to live that a little bit on set too and that's where it's like you know the circumstances here again add to the film where if this was a bigger budgeted film, would this stuff exist? Would these dynamics be conveyed that well on screen? Because there are so many real life dynamics created because of this low budget. And I think that's one of the things that makes this film so iconic. Without some stuff like that, this could have just fell by the wayside. This could just be another mid 70s film that uh, has been filed away and forgotten about. But with those dynamics and the feel of this film, uh, it had so much to it. Yeah, and, you know, one of the things also with it being considered an independent film uh, that we should note is that this was distributed by uh, the Bryanston Company, distribution company, which uh, turned out to be a, uh, a mafia front uh, oper operated by uh, Louis uh, Periona, also known by the name of Butchie, uh, who used the movie to uh, launder profits he made from Deep Throat in 1972. Uh, in the return, the production received enough money to reimburse the investors and pay the cast uh, and crew $405 a piece. <laughs> so they had eventually discovered that the money, that the rest of the money from its earnings and everything had been laundered and had been stolen. So all of this being a smash success, nobody who made it saw any of that. So, wow. you know, it all just kind of got pushed away because this... Uh, this this gangster who was kind of like i said fronting everything uh just kind of took the money and ran after it was all said and done it, what a unique circumstance i mean we've talked about child's play too and a couple other films in terms of production and how that went through this is such a such a weird occurrence you know to think that you know the other face is tied to the mafia apparently oh yeah no leatherface definitely has uh has some ties with the gangsters I can see. Uh, but yeah i mean like even just going into it though like a lot of this stuff was even the sets and everything were all pretty much everything of course was handmade and all that they had uh we were talking about it before we started filming uh the opening was supposed to be a completely different shot in the script it was supposed to be a dead dog in the uh on the day of shooting they actually found a dead horse but it was so gross and it was so burnt up and disgusting that nobody wanted to film uh, the dead horse because they were afraid they were going to throw up. Uh, so, you know, just one of those things where they're a location scout. The guy who was helping him, you know, find everything in Texas was like, you never see this stuff, man. Like, what are you doing? Like, you got to get out there and, and get this shot. But no, nobody wanted to do it. So he ended up going and taxidermying an armadillo he found on the side of the road. And he became so... Uh, you know, perplexed with it and all the hard work that he put into it, that uh, when the day of shooting came, I think somebody had suggested maybe they run it over. And he was like, you're not going to run over my armadillo. And he got real defensive about it. And he, he still, to the day of the documentary, uh, believes that Toby Hooper was the guy who mentioned that. But Toby, uh, you know, even though he's passed on by this point, has said that, no, I I never said that. I, we were never going to run over his taxidermied armadillo. <laughs> Um, so that's why that's where we got that out of that. I always thought that that was a neat story as well. 
and that's where you know i say this feels like texas like an armadillo for me is like synonymous with texas so i'm like okay perfect choice but you know having a dead dog at the very beginning i think would have been also interesting just because i think they they talk about it in the documentary where it's like a you know house pet so everyone can kind of relate to it a little bit um and that kind of being unsettled already i think would be interesting as well uh but you know like just to show the roadkill especially with what they're going to be talking about in terms of you know the the slaughterhouses and the smells there real smart way to start this off mm -hmm. and you know i think it should be uh noted here that this does predate uh halloween because halloween came out in 1978 this is 1974 so it is one of those ones where it's like that can be said that you know even though this does predate it it was such a small independent film that it really you know kind of fell under the radar in a sense uh for more people it wasn't until after the success of halloween that this one uh kind of started to gain more prominence again because horror started to become uh, a bigger thing so it's like we like to say a lot of people like to say that halloween started everything uh when it came to you know horror but there were classic horror films being made before Halloween. Halloween was kind of just the one to, you know, to really get people on board when it comes yeah. to Hollywood and kind of uh, how you go. Even that being an independent film itself uh, still was further Hollywoodized than something like this. This was definitely just a couple of uh, people who wrote a script and got some friends together and went out and shot it kind of thing. Yeah, and, and like I had said earlier, like this and um, Black Christmas, I really feel like we're the turning point into what we were going to get uh, in the late 70s and, and throughout the 80s, where it's almost that genre change a little bit in terms of what subgenres we're really going to be focusing on, because, you know, we're moving out of monster movies and, you know, a lot of that type of... Uh, I don't know, Universal Monsters, you know, you know, them, things like that. We're going to move into things that are maybe a little bit more real. Like we're actually not dealing with aliens from outer space. We're dealing with, you know, this uh, psychotic family from from Texas where it's like you can kind of more so relate to it. So or, you know, a stalker, um, you know, in the in the attic making obscene phone calls where this and Black Christmas really were those turning points to kind of make horror a little more real and more relatable to its audience yeah and uh i think it's also uh needs to be said that this was a movie that uh they did not release in the uk uh this was labeled as video nasty it was one of those uh early ones uh that they would it hardly got distribution other than in the united states um so it was one of those ones that it definitely took time it took a long long time before this movie could really catch uh, everywhere around the world and everybody got a chance to see it. Uh, just again, because of how prudish and everything uh, the MPAA and all that was at the time too. Like they were afraid to show anything, uh, you know, all that stuff. But yeah. an another uh, piece to this that I thought was very interesting was um, how with this film, uh, when it comes to all those bones and body parts that we see throughout the film, uh, all the bones and everything come from uh, local farms where, you know, uh, they used to, uh, the city would come by and pick up livestock if it had passed away and they would take it to a place where they would get rid of it. Um, well, they started charging farmers to do that. And I think in the, in the mid sixties, so they stopped doing that. They would just find a, uh, a part of their land because it's like why would they pay uh the city to do it when they were going to do it for free before so it's just kind of like they would just find a section of land where they would take the bodies and they would just kind of dump them out and let them you know decompose and do what they're going to do um so you know them knowing this some of the people from the set design would go around to farms and ask if they could take bones and other animal bits and parts uh, from all of these and they would clean them up and set dress them and everything and bring them to set. So that's why we see some of these like very um, interesting looking, um, you know, designs when it comes to like bones being uh, put on strings and stuff like that, almost decorations like throughout the house. Yeah. Um, they also had a, a local veterinarian who, you know, had a multitude of different animals. There were stuff from monkeys. There were stuff from, all kinds of different animals that, uh, you know, had passed away that, uh, he had a little graveyard behind the, uh, 
uh, veterinary clinic, uh, and they were able to take some of the bones from that as well. So they they kind of really were using a lot of real shit on uh, the making of this film, which is very intriguing. And I mean, that adds to the realness, but again, I, I think a film of circumstance where it's like, we don't have the budget to create a bunch of props that, you know, may not even look real, but having to actually, actually use the real deal things add so many layers to this film to make it feel not dated. You know what I mean? Where you watch it and you're like, well, that feels real because it is real. Yeah. And I think one of the more interesting techniques that they use for this film, um, you know, when we talk about making it feel real or making it feel like something impactful, um, is that one of the one of Toby Hooper's techniques of making the film more intense was cutting a small number of frames off of the shot preceding something violent occurring. Uh, this small beat catches the viewer off guard as their eyes have become uh, accustomed to a certain shot being a specific length. Cinematographer Daniel Pearl also mentioned that a misdirection trick Hooper would use, which was having something on the left side of the frame, then cutting the leather face on the right side. So I don't know if you've ever noticed that, but like, yeah, if you go and you watch this, uh, moments before kills, you'll start to see like the frames dip and then uh, you'll you'll hear the sound, especially with, um, oh God, why am I, I wanted to call him Jim for some reason, uh, Kirk, Kirk's death. Uh, you know, it's like the frames kind of dip there as soon as the strike is about to happen and it cuts. Uh, cause it's like, you don't see him really follow through with it, but you hear it and then it shows him on the ground. So it's one of those things where it's like, it's so quick, your brain doesn't even register it. And you know, it does leave you kind of, that's why I think it adds to that, uh, disturbed nature. Yeah. Of the, of I'm going to have to go through and watch this again with a different lens now. Cause I never really paid attention to it. Oh yeah. But yeah, that's a lot of the stuff I wanted to hit on as far as the behind the scenes when it comes to the making of this movie. I mean, there's a ton of stuff. I highly recommend checking out that documentary on YouTube if you don't own the uh, Blu-rays with it. Um, I know it's not on every release, but I think even if you buy it on Vudu, I think that you'll get it. Um, but if you just type in the making of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre on YouTube, it'll be the first thing that comes up. It's about an hour and 12 minutes long. Uh, so it, it's pretty good. It's, uh, off of the blue underground release and, is, and, uh, what's been uploaded. I don't know. This film has a most, one of the most unique kind of roads to actually being made where there's so many different interesting tidbits and documentaries out there that have different takes on it, different interviews from other people's perspective to really sh show what it took to get this thing off the ground. So, I mean, we focused on probably some of it here, but there's so many different tidbits that you really can take away from this film. This is an independent film through and through um, and has one of the most unique stories out of probably any film. Absolutely. But we'll move on for the sake of the podcast and so we don't uh, dwell too much. Because like I said, I had so many more little uh, fun facts and things. I'll probably uh, spit them out, especially because we can start talking about the cast stuff here. Yeah. Uh, but we'll be moving into our next segment, which we like to call uh, You Are All My Children. You are all my children now. Alrighty, so this is where we like to break down the cast and crew and just talk about everybody uh, who was in the film, our favorite characters, actors, you know, giving everybody their kind of their due as far as uh, what we feel stands out to us in this movie. Now, Luke, uh, what would you say as far as uh, characters, actors, who stands out in this movie for you? Uh, character wise, got to be Franklin. I mean, <laughs> I think he's the one that kind of really, in terms of that cast, I think really is uh, unique in himself. Um, in terms of the villains, I think the entire family, uh, Leatherface, the Hitchhiker, you know, all of them are, are unique in their own way. And I think that's probably why uh, this film, I mean, there are many reasons why this film is, is still talked about to this day, but they they manage to give these performances that are so memorable where you're not really uh lingering too much on a lot of backstory you're really focusing on the here and now and kind of just living uh through the experience that they've provided at that point and i think that's really due to some of the the stronger character work 
Absolutely. For me, um, I'm going to say as far as villains go, I'm, I'm giving it to Jim Sidow. Uh, of course, I love Gunnar Hansen's portrayal of Leatherface. Um, and, you know, Edwin uh, Neal as the hitchhiker is also very memorable. But, uh, you know, Jim Sidow for me was one of those things where it's like, again, he feels the most grounded. He feels like he could live in society. Yeah. Uh, and that's why he is just one of the more uh, frightening aspects to the movie for me. Um, and, you know, for me, uh, as far as human, like, not human, but our main characters go, I think Marilyn Burns. I think that she's just one of the the early final girls. Uh, she even predates Lori. So it's one of those yeah. things where it's like, uh, you know, she gets herself out of that situation. And, you know, there's all this speculation on, you know, did she go crazy after this event? Did she ever recover? <laughs> you know, what happens after the Texas Chainsaw Massacre? Um, and, you know, they kind of glaze over that a little bit in the sequels. But, uh, you know, it wasn't until this most recent one where they tried to make her come back as, you know, that Laurie Strode Halloween 2018 effect that uh, I think we could both agree did not work not uh, not in that film. But we'll, we'll save that. We got a few years uh, before we get to that one. A lot to say. Oh, yeah. But, um, yeah, it's one of those things where I think that her performance, uh, not even just in the terrifying sequences, but just like the kind of humanity that she brings and just the way that she kind of uh, portrays her character. Um, I, I absolutely adore her. She's one of my favorite final girls in cinema. Um, so it's like, I got to give it to her. Yeah. And not, not an over the top performance. And I think mm -hmm. again, I I've talked about it when I've talked about Ethan Hawke, where there's a subtleness to their performances that uh, really add so much to make them feel real. And I think that really goes, uh in line with her as well but again she has one of the most iconic scenes probably in horror and filmmaking uh with her at the end just uh losing her mind and laughing so you know there's a reason why she can create these memorable scenes yeah it's uh you know it's definitely it's a balancing act i would say when it comes to leading any horror film that's male or yep. female between you know being horrified and actually having a character um, you know, and I think that they really strike this one well. I think that she's definitely on that Mount Rushmore of final girls, uh, Sally Hardesty. You know, it's just one of those things where it's like, when you think about it, like she is one of those, uh, definitely one of those ones that you want to, you know, you always associate with classic horror, uh, yeah. when it comes to the slasher genre, I should say, uh, you always see her, you see Lori, um, you know, in my mind, you see people like Amy Steele, and stuff like that from uh that from friday 13th part two um you know it's like there's all these people that come to mind um and you know she's definitely one of them adrian king also i'd say uh even though she you know doesn't survive the second film uh she still stands out to me as one of those classic final girls and then as you get deeper into each of these franchises we get other characters too like rachel from part four of halloween and stuff like that you know it's just like you, the list goes on, but like if you're talking top tier Mount Rushmore characters, uh, I'd say Sally Hardesty, Marilyn Bernstein, she's one of the best. Yeah, and, and that's where it's like at that point she didn't really have a reference point. You know what I mean? Where it's like everyone mm -hmm. looking at Rachel from Halloween 4, which I love as well, can look at the groundwork that had been laid before from the, you know, Texas Chainsaw Massacre, the original Halloween, and kind of work from that. Whereas uh Texas Chainsaw Massacre was one of the first of its kind in terms of kind of that subgenre and really redirecting where horror was going so you didn't really have that final girl equation you know to mm -hmm. really reference it all and I want to talk about Gunnar Hansen uh you know he is the OG original uh Leatherface uh you know just something where he was one of the uh, obviously the patriarchs to this character you know there's a lot of people who have filled those shoes and who have uh done their own interpretations of it i mean again we talked about it a little bit earlier but he brings such humanity to this role in a lot of ways where it's like he adds that kind of element of mental illness and that is more that he is afraid and less so um you know evil or sadistic in any kind of way like he goes along with this because this is all he knows and i think yeah. that's such a smart way to portray uh your poster villain in a sense you know and i think it's funny because yeah he's a poster villain but you know in when he is uh introduced to when we see him with kirk and with pam and everyone else where he's 
you know, you're focusing on him as almost like the main villain. But then it's an interesting dynamic because I can't think of really anyone in any of these other, you know, horror icon franchises where as soon as the family dynamic is interplayed, he almost feels like he's playing like third chair where the hitchhiker and, um, oh, what's his name? Why am I forgetting his name? Uh, the one, the older guy. that Oh, the old man? Yes. Um, he feels like he's like almost third in line where he's afraid uh, to step on anyone's toes, you know? So it's like you have this dynamic of he seems like the mainstay player, but then as soon as he gets with the family, he's almost just kind of uh, falling in line with their orders. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's like, it, he does bring this kind of childlike, uh, you know, humanity to it, which is interesting because, uh, you know, he does come back a little bit in uh, the archival footage for uh, Texas Chainsaw. He also does play another character called Boss Sawyer in that film. Um, I you know, obviously, I don't believe I'm double checking. Yeah, he doesn't play uh, Leatherface throughout the entirety of the film. But it is just one of those things where it's just kind of like he never really got a chance to come back and like really give this role another shot. Yeah. And, you know, uh, a good part of that is uh, because he always felt like he was underpaid. And of course, you know, knowing studios and how they would go uh, for the second film, you know, he wanted to come back and do it for Toby, but uh, they only wanted to pay him to scale, even though he was like, well, I'm Leatherface. I am the main, you know, antagonist of the film. I'm on all the posters. I'm doing all this. Like, why am I just getting paid to scale? Like, I should get a little bit more than that, don't you think? And they were like, oh, no, we'll, we'll just recast you then. And, uh, well, look, it was kind of funny because for the second one, they were like, oh, we'll give you scale plus 10%. And he's like, well, what's 10% for? They're like, oh, that's for your agent. And then he was like, oh, I don't have an agent, so can't you factor that in? And they were like, oh, yeah, we'll get back to you. And then they just gave him scale. And they were like, well, you don't have an agent, so we don't have to pay you 10%. So it's like really crummy stuff and it just kept happening as they went along they just didn't give a shit they were like we'll throw anybody in the mask and and that's where it's like you know uh, the missteps that were taken in terms of uh the underestimation of how much the horror community loves uh, a lot of these properties where it's like well we could just throw anyone in there and it's not gonna matter it's like that's not how it works like there are very specific parameters that some of these original actors set that we just need back in order to create that magic mm-hmm Yep. And, you know, it's just kind of one of those things where it's like, that's just the way the uh, the crookie crumbles, I guess, when it comes to Hollywood. They don't appreciate you, especially if, if you're a masked character. The way they see it is they just need somebody uh, bulky need that can carry a chainsaw. Yep, a body. That's pretty much all you are, which is garbage. But, uh, you know, we see it worked out for as, as things went along. It worked out for some like we had, uh, you know, um, Kane Hodder got to play Jason a few times. He did. Uh, so, yeah, it's definitely, you know, they, they started to get there a little bit. There's one. Yeah. And then, obviously, we're going to talk about uh, Paul Partain, uh, the guy you spoke about with Franklin there. Uh, what a performance that he had to give. Like, seriously, just to be such a, a conniving, little hated little character. Like, yeah. he is so annoying throughout this film. Uh, but, again, you do sympathize with him. You understand why he is the way he is, maybe. But, like, there are just some sequences, especially when, um, you know, Sally is trying to go find her friends and he's just sitting there like, oh, Sally, don't leave me, Sally, please. Oh, God, don't you? And, you know, just yeah. doing all that. It's just like he grates on you throughout this film. And apparently the actor is very nice. He's a very good guy. Yeah. Uh, everybody really enjoyed working with him, but his character was complete little uh, sniveling Bullshit. little bastard. Yeah. And that's where it's like, because uh, I've heard the same thing, and to kind of step out of the box and continuously have that switch on to make everybody hate you um, while filming and not filming is uh, such a task in itself because mm -hmm. he, obviously it worked. Because it, it, anytime I watch this film, it's like I just start re hating Franklin no matter what. <laughs> Absolutely. There are some people who say that they cheer when Franklin dies. I don't necessarily cheer. Uh, even though it is uh, one of the best uh, kills in the movie, but uh, it is uh, it is one of those things where it's like, okay, well, at least uh, at least that is done. Um, but yeah, I mean, is there anybody else that you really want to highlight in the uh, in the cast and crew segment? I mean, we have uh, 
Alan Danzinger as Jerry, William Vale as Kirk, uh, Terry Mc, uh, McMinn as Pam. Those three, uh, maybe we could throw them all together because they, you know, they're good for their roles. They're fine. They don't yeah. really do much else in Hollywood after that. Uh, you know, they they had a lot of fun making this movie. Some of them swore off filmmaking after this one because it was such a tough shoot. I can see that. Um, but I mean, they're all serviceable. They all play very, uh, you know, nice, realistic portrayals of, I want to say, young adults. I wouldn't say teenagers, but yeah, definitely college age, maybe a little older young adult characters. Yeah, I mean, they're part of the, ca- you know, the ensemble cast there. It's like not, none of their performances are offensive. It's like, nah, well, you know, you don't want to see any of them die except maybe Franklin. But mm-hmm. um, everyone else is just kind of, you know, serviceable for their roles. And, you know, the, the ending part is more so focused on Sally. Oh, yeah. And I guess we should probably mention, I almost uh, buzzed past him, Edwin Neal uh, as the hitchhiker. Yes. Oops. Yep. We, yeah. He's... Um, he adds so much, especially for that. He's first terrifying. And like, especially that first interaction of like, kind of, you know, we're kind of going, not really being introduced to any weird characters. And for that to be the first one that we really meet is just like, wow. You know, it, yeah. <laughs> the, 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 um, the dynamic that he brings into that van is just like, it turns this whole film on its head. I love when he uh, is like, he takes a picture of Franklin and he's like, all right, that'll be $2. And then he's just like, I, I'm not giving you money for this. And he gets upset with him. And it's just like, oh God, no, it's just two bucks, man. Like, what do you mean? Like, I don't know what the fuck I would do if I was caught in that situation. Yes. I mean, personally, uh, I don't pick up hitchhikers. I mean, I'm sorry. Like if you're a hitchhiker, like I feel for you, like do your thing. But like, I've seen way too many horror movies to know that that's just a ba- that's bad news, and I've never yeah. even seen The Hitchhiker. And so and, you know, this one here, this sticks with you. So it's like you know, you you watch Texas Chainsaw Massacre one time, and you pick up Hitchhikers, you will not be picking them up uh, the next go around. Absolutely, but yeah, he brings an awesome performance to it. Very memorable death too. I, I gotta say, like getting smashed by the uh, yeah. the thing, and you know, I gotta say. Uh, I love him to death, but I think I love his brother even more, uh, which we'll have to wait till next Thanksgiving uh, before we can dive into that. But yeah, his his brother is very interesting in and of itself. And I love the dynamic of both those performances. You can really tell they're actually uh, related just by how uh, the actor who portrays his brother uh, pulled so much from Edwin Neal's performance here. And yeah, uh, I mean, other than that, we can talk a little bit about Toby Hooper uh, and just what a, a wonderful career that man has had. I mean, he is no longer with us at this moment in time, which is unfortunate. Um, but, you know, I mean, we're talking this for me, Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2, uh, Poltergeist, Funhouse, Crocodile is another one that I enjoy. Um, you know, no, and that's, of course, not a great film. But uh, he also did work on Tales from the Crypt, Freddy's Nightmares. Um, you know, Life Force is one that I've been wanting to get around to seeing. Uh, he's also the director of the original Salem's Lot. So, I mean, like, he's got quite a career. Yeah, he's he's uh, touched on a lot of iconic horror properties for certain. Um, Funhouse is one that we were, we're certainly going to talk about at some point. Uh he just had a very specific eye, I think, and really brought a lot uh, to the horror genre, I, you know, uh, in terms of filmmaking, especially. I mean, this one speaks for itself. He's paved the way for a lot of people to kind of come in and do something different and really change the game in terms of the horror genre. Mm-hmm. And then uh, he's got something here I've never heard of called The Mangler. Are you familiar with that? Mm, nope. It doesn't sound familiar to me. Looks kind of interesting there. And then, uh, of course, uh, one that did catch my eye here, if this is what I think it is. Where did it go? Uh, he did a, okay, body bags. He did a segment on that. Isn't um, that, uh, that's pretty, yeah, yeah, that yeah, has John, uh, Carpenter. John Carpenter. Yeah, okay, so yeah, he did a segment in body bags, along with like Wes Craven and other people too. Okay, we'll have to discuss body bags. I love body bags. Oh, absolutely! I've never seen it, so I don't oh. talk about it. Yeah, yes, oh, I, I know that's that's one of those ones that uh, eluded me a little bit. So we'll we'll definitely be covering it at some point. 
All righty. But yeah, I guess that's going to wrap us up for cast and crew. So we can move into the next segment, which we call Creatures Features. You've got to be fucking kidding. So this is where we discuss kind of the uh, our special effects segment where we like to go in deep dive on everything and cover just uh, all the gore, guts, monsters, whatever it took to kind of bring these classic horror films to life. And uh, in this film, like we said, very low budget. So there's not a ton that you can really uh, dive into. Uh, but I think uh, the big showcase is going to be Leatherface and how he looked himself and the sets. Yes. I mean, the set design in this film is crazy when it comes to the house and just all that they were able to fill it with. Like we said, they were getting bones from a veterinarian. They were getting bones from farmers and they just made these very intricate kind of uh, sculptures and little uh, decorations and things like that. And they hung it all up around the house, uh, really just showing the depravity of these characters and just what they were doing with their victims once they had their way with them. Yeah, and that's where it's like diving into horror. Um, sometimes you, you get that n not so genuine kind of feel toward it where it feels like a set design doesn't feel real enough. Where Texas Chainsaw Massacre, uh, I touched on it already, feels absolutely real because it is. Um, I think, you know, finding those actual bones and things like that adds such so much more to the elements of horror here um and that's why this kind of lives on is because it's not going to get that dated look because this stuff is actually real mm -hmm. and you know i i gotta say that i i love everything they did with uh leatherface for being such a minimalist kind of uh portrayal you know they they really put a lot of work into the mask and trying to make it look like skin uh, at one point, they said that they they layered so much latex that it still was like had that translucent kind of effect to it. So when it laid over his face, it still resembled kind of skin that had dried out. And they used latex and stuff, too, because it yellowed really nicely. So it would look like it was tan skin a little bit. Um, and, you know, it's like they put a lot of work into that in all three of the masks because they have, uh, you know, his his normal mask, the one that we see him start with one they call the old man and then another one is obviously the uh, the woman that he uses to wear that mask when he's cooking and it, it's he almost uses them as personalities in a sense too they dive a little deeper into that into the other films uh almost a comedic effect in some of the later ones but you know it's always been very interesting to me of how he assembles and creates these masks and that's one of the things i wanted to dive into is these different masks because that what a smart piece of storytelling where you have the normal one where it's just for his, you know, basically his killing. And then you have one where he's doing the domestic around the house in terms of, I think, the one he's carrying a spoon in the, in the house, you know, doing the cooking. And then th that third one is, you know, almost a uh, formal version of him sitting down at the table. And uh, I believe one of the things was to say that uh, those are his per superficial personalities because under the mask there isn't that much. There isn't a personality there because he's just kind of blank. And I thought that was so so interesting to kind of, um, you know, this could have just been a Michael Myers or a Jason Voorhees with one mask, but they actually add to the dynamic of uh, Leatherface here and try to give him something a little bit extra. And that's why I think uh, this character maybe is set apart a little bit because of everything that is going on with this character. He's not just this this random killer just doing it to do it. Um, there is, uh, you know, things underneath uh that is making him struggle um and just adding that elements to the mask and having three instead of just one i think really adds to it oh yeah and you know it's just one of those things that they would expand on in later sequels too with Leatherface of him you know adding more characters to his ensemble uh bringing some of these characters back and you know it's just uh it's always something that you can attribute to uh Leatherface as a whole is just kind of one of his holy original concepts and ideas there um and then again you know they used a lot of uh you know the props department used a lot of real meats and things like that especially for the dinner sequence for people to eat and consume 
uh, which, you know, obviously with it being 110 outside, they had to make it look like it was dark. So they had all the windows shut. So it was uh, upwards of 100, 125 degrees inside of that, uh, that little house there where they were shooting. And they shot for 24 hours on that sequence, they said. And everybody was completely exhausted, uh, you know, burnt out, uh, dehydrated, everything he could. And the meat started to smell really bad towards the uh, mid to end of that shoot, apparently. And it really got him into character. So that was uh, that was rough. The reason that they had to uh, do it that way, too, which sucked, was because uh, Jim Sidow, they only had him for a week. And that was one of the last things they shot because they didn't think it was going to take that long. But it ended up taking a whole lot longer. And that's where it's like inadvertently the realness of this film signs through on that lens and it creates something so special. Absolutely. But yeah, no, that I would say that, you know, there's not a whole lot of effects that we could really dive into other than what we just covered, but the stuff that we do see is, is wonderful. I guess the graveyard stuff too, we'd say that's very well handled and those opening shots also look great. Created a very um, memorable, like one of the first scenes in the film, um, just to focus on that again, really sets the tone for what we're going to see later on. Absolutely. And like, you know, the hitchhiker, he's got a little bit of makeup on him as well. So it's one of those things where he really sticks out as uh, his performance, I think, carries that more. So he doesn't yeah. need that eccentric kind of makeup. But like, I mean, he's still the little bit that they give him is still great. So, all righty, that brings us into our last segment here, which we like to call the check is in the mail. Just listen to the old pork job express and take his advice on a dark and stormy night. All right. When some wild-eyed eight-foot-tall maniac grabs your neck, taps the back of your favorite head up against a barroom wall, and he looks you crooked in the eye, and he asks you if you've paid your dues. Well, you just stare that big sucker right back in the eye, and you remember what old Jack Burton always says at a time like that. Have you paid your dues, Jack? Yes, sir, the check is in the mail. Alrighty, and this is our final segment where we just kind of do our wrap-up talk about the legacy of this film and also uh just overall impressions ratings whatever you want to say uh but i mean i think it's easy to say that this is one of the most iconic horror films in cinema uh it has gone on to inspire so many things you even see it today i mentioned it earlier so many people compared uh this year's x just in tone and look to this film alone you can definitely tell that that's what ty west was kind of going for with this um, and then so on and so forth. We, we wouldn't get movies like, uh, you know, the original Wrong Turn and stuff like that, I don't think, without films like this. And, you know, just a lot of other slashers in general, I think, would pull uh, from just the depravity and kind of the way that it marketed itself, um, you know, using the psycho technique. And we all got to give props to Texas Chainsaw Massacre for that. And that's where it's like looking at this film where... He you can't maybe look at something like a Halloween or a Friday 13th and say they've directly pulled from uh Texas Chainsaw Massacre that is evident, but you'd be hard pressed to find a horror director, probably an independent film uh, maker as well to say that Texas Chainsaw Massacre wasn't some sort of influence because this really brought a lot of realism to horror, you know, um, changing that elements and creating that subgenre. So we would see what was just going to be this one-off independent film. Um, that's that DNA that it created spread throughout the horror community uh, from the late seventies into the nineties. And even in today, because this is one of the most discussed films in horror. And this is one of those films where you watch those documentaries and you get the behind the scenes. It's absolutely inspirational for people who want to make small films. Even if you're not intrigued by making a horror film, you have to watch the making of Texas Chainsaw Massacre to, to understand the passion and the workarounds that you have to do and the accommodations that you have to make in order to uh, take that concept that's in your head and put it onto screen because that's what Toby Hooper did. And that's why this film lives on um, even today Today, and, you know, getting those 4K releases and special edition Blu-rays and things like that. This is one of those films that's absolutely worthy of that. Yeah, and, you know, it's one of those things where you will probably continue to hear about this film for, you know, another 20 years at least, Absolutely. and maybe so on and so forth. I think it's cemented itself enough uh, just because it it really does have that kind of 
it can stand the test of time. It, it has shown that, you know, it's, it's a film that you can learn from. I know when we were making a short film a few years back, I, I watched that uh, making of documentary uh, a couple times in preparation for it, just because it was just one of those things where it's like, you can learn so much just from hearing the stories and the struggles that uh, the actors and people went through uh, making a classic like this. And it's just one of those things where it's like, you'll, you'll have a hard time replicating this and you know as far as the series goes yeah there are some that are better than others uh i think it's one of the the most up and down series as far as the the big mount rushmore of horror characters um and you know there's definitely detractors and divisions and we're going to get into some of those but you know it's something where it's like i think that at some point there it's going to tip like there's going to be a scale that tips and we are going to get something that I think if they keep taking a stab at it, they will eventually find something that is worthy to call itself a sequel to this first film. And, and I think I hope we get there. And I think there's something to be said about, about the quality of this film, because it seems like Hollywood does have this infatuation in terms of trying to create uh, what the original almost encapsulated and almost bottled up in, you know, they haven't been able to uh, release it since this film was created, just because this is such a standalone film. And it, again, isn't the most in-depth storytelling. They just created something very different, something special here, where the uh, an adequate sequel, in theory, shouldn't be too difficult to create um, something at least a C-plus film to say, okay, this is decent enough to be in the conversation. But it seems like, you know, it's just a swing and a miss a lot of the times here, and has created this volatile um, franchise in terms of quality. So it's like this film continues to be studied to see what exactly made it special. And I think, you know, that person was Toby Hooper and uh, the feel that he wanted to create something special here. And so it's very hard to kind of replicate that. I mean, one day, do I think they will? Sure. I think they can create, create something very adequate in terms of a follow-up and a, a decent sequel, but it just seems like, you know, we've just loved it recently where we thought maybe, we could get something interesting and it turned out another swing and a miss. So it just seems like, you know, the track record there uh, to create uh, the, a, sub, a substantial legacy to Texas Chainsaw Massacre hasn't been uh, realized yet. I mean, hopes continue. I really think they could create something. I think the elements are on the table and there are directors out there that could really take a stab at this and make something unique. It just, they haven't found it yet. Yeah. But I, I am hopeful. I think that, you know, you get the right team behind it. I think there's enough people that love this film uh, and get a nice, unique idea uh, that kind of really pays tribute to this and kind of gets you in the right space and you don't just be lazy with it. We can get something that probably never will amount to what this is, but at least be a follow up that is worthy of saying that it is a follow up. Yeah, to I, this think film. I think it'd be hard to create the sustaining legacy that the original Texas Chainsaw Massacre has. But at the very least, you can create at least a decent follow-up. I would hope so. But already, guys, yeah, of course, I think we're both going to recommend this highly. We both Absolutely. love this film. This is one of our all-time favorites. The Texas Chainsaw Massacre, if you have not seen it and you listen to this whole podcast, what are you doing? Go watch it. It's one of the best of all time. Uh, definitely, you know, I would say even more appropriate for the Thanksgiving holiday, maybe watch a few days before or after, uh, just so that way you don't spoil yourself on uh, Thanksgiving, because if it's your first watch, you might get a little disgusted. So you want to make sure that you're ready to go when uh, mealtime comes that day. So Unless you're not eating meat that day. Yeah, that's true, which uh, you won't be, so that's uh, you, you might be able to watch it. So There we go. Maybe you should watch Texas Chainsaw Massacre too. It's, it's coming sooner, sooner rather than later. <laughs> And then, all right, we'll see. But uh, yeah, I think that this is just one of those ones that, you know, we'll obviously probably not the last time we'll ever discuss this film on the channel. We'll probably talk about it in some form of way another time. But I think yeah, it was nice to this one a handful of times already in previous podcasts. Oh, yeah. I, I mean, I think so. Yeah, it's just nice to finally get down to it. And I think we can say this is our first uh, real slasher icon since the reboot to kind of grace the screens like we've never highlighted an individual i mean we talked halloween yeah. with 2018 and kills but like as far as the original runs go like this is the first one i'd say that we got to really highlight so far it depends on where you see chucky uh child's play too yeah i guess i guess i could give it to that so he could take that crown 
But yeah, for me, this was definitely something I was excited to do. Uh, initially, we were throwing a couple different films around uh, for November, what we wanted to do. But I, I thought that this, when I landed on this, I thought this would be a, a perfect time. Talk some Texas Chainsaw, make this our little tradition. So hopefully you'll be back with us again here uh, sooner rather than later. But if not, and you only are here for the Texas Chainsaw content, uh, meet back with us here around this time next year. We'll be talking Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2. Uh, and we'll finally get to hash this out, Luke, because I am a fan of that film and you need to revisit it. So I'll revisit it and then I'm going to take a year to construct my rebuttal to your uh, thumbs <laughs> up to Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2. All right. Sounds good to me. But uh, all righty, guys. Uh, other than that, you guys can follow us on our social medias at Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok at Splattercast Pop, where you can keep up with all of the latest and greatest. Keep an eye out on the channel, as this week we have a lot of great stuff coming to you. We got a review for Bones and All coming up in a few days, as well as a special treat coming to you guys on Thanksgiving. So keep an eye out for that. A little fun little flick I'm having Luke check out for the first time. Uh, we will see sure. about that. Oh, yeah, it's going to be wild. Um, and then, of course, we also have our live stream on Black Friday at 9 p.m. for Terrifier 2, where we do our little commentary and watch along. So if you're interested in that, feel free to hop in there with us and watch it. It's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, we'll just get to talk Terrifier and uh, just how awesome it's been to see this movie go on its little journey over the last few months and go from just being this little tiny independent film to making, I believe they've crested almost 14 million at the box office. They just continue to climb, sir. Yeah, last I checked, it was up there pretty high. So it's like, it's great for them. Uh, I'm really, really happy with where that's been going. So yeah, I'm excited to sit down and talk with you guys on that. And of course, uh, keep us back here again, where we'll have the Sunday scaries the following Sunday and more content to come. So stay with us. Uh, we'll keep producing more and more. And then unless you're just here for the podcast, meet back here in two weeks with another one uh this time a luke pick so other than that luke you got anything for him no uh we got a, like dylan said we got a lot of more uh a lot more content coming your way should be very interesting yes my pick is up next and uh let's hope you don't get caught in the headlights okay sounds good to me all righty but until next time i'm dylan newell and i'm luke janesco and remember stay scared yeah.